Now, there are a lot of issues around in Indigenous affairs at the moment, and one thing that really strikes to the core for me is the role of truth in our history. Very controversial at the moment because of the book Dark Emu, written by Bruce Pascoe, where a lot of the so-called facts in that book are being challenged. So it was a pleasure to catch up with the Indigenous Affairs Minister, Ken Wyatt, just a few minutes ago. Minister, thanks for joining us. So I just want to ask you first up about the Prime Minister's speech last night. He wants business to be able to get on and invest and projects go ahead in this country. And he's promised to cut down on red tape and green tape slowing down development approvals. Uh, are you satisfied that Indigenous concerns, Aboriginal heritage objections and those sorts of issues won't be pushed to the side, that you'll still get proper consideration of those? I, look, I, I don't have a concern because each of these will be debated and considered in the context of the reforms. I think the other issue is tear tape. Uh, and by that I mean red tape and green tape associated with local government, state governments and then the Commonwealth. So there are multiple layers in all of this. And the PM's quite right because the article I read uh, in respect to uh, firefighters in Queensland not being able to do burnbacks because of red tape. So I think common sense has to prevail, but at the same time we need to look at what we protect and why the purpose of that restriction was established and consider each on merit. I mean, there's a lot of scope for reform here, isn't there? As you say, at the local, state and federal level, uh, people trying to invest, trying to get projects underway, they're just continually confounded by red tape, by court challenges, by legal processes. I suppose we've seen that more, no more clearly recently than Adani, who have been battling for years before they got their go-ahead. But even aged care, when I was Minister for Aged Care, same issue. They're having to deal with local government red tape, then state government planning issues that uh, was an imposition and then of course meeting Commonwealth requirements and concepts that were developed sometimes took four to five years to put into reality and yet demand is there and common sense should have prevailed and that's what I hope that when we do the red tape reduction we cut to the chase and look at key areas that are absolutely strategic we still need to balance the need around the environment but let's not make it onerous and the Indigenous issues as well. We need to consider uh, how we negotiate and reach resolution. And I'm finding that there is a, uh, a propensity to enter into agreements more readily now than what we used to see in the past. Well, on the area of Indigenous affairs, you've spoken out of late about the way history is taught in schools and elsewhere when it comes to our Indigenous history. What's wrong with how our history is taught in schools now? Well, it's not only schools, it's the way in which uh, the history of Australia has been portrayed over a long period of time. And this is reflected in my thinking from people who say to me, why wasn't I taught uh, the true history of this nation? Why wasn't I taught about uh, the place of Indigenous Australians? And of course, Bruce Pascoe's book has certainly created an interest at a very different level because he takes a series of propositions from research has put them into a book and that has challenged people's thinking. So schools should play an important role in ensuring that uh, the shared history uh, of a community in which they, they're placed is reflected in some of the teaching that occurs. I'm not calling for a, uh, a substantial change to the curriculum at all. What I am encouraging is the way in which communities both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal come together and talk about the, the um, timelines and histories of their towns, like the Mile Creek Massacre. Uh, what I really respect was the way in which the Indigenous and non-Indigenous people have come together, looked at the history of what occurred, the local government has put a monument into place, and the community are continuing to work on initiatives that will enhance that area for the history of their local um, town and site to be known. Yeah, I think uh, you, the focus on local areas helps to bring history to life. People learn about the Indigenous engagement uh, and the Indigenous issues, uh, good and bad, in their own area. But on an issue like Mile Creek, for instance, there's the shocking travesty of the massacre. 
But then I suppose there's the counterintuitive history that people were charged and prosecuted for murder, so it showed very clearly that this sort of thing was not tolerated, at least officially. And that's what we've got to bring forward, Chris, because history is always different uh, in geographic locations across our nation. The cattle industry was built on uh, the work of Indigenous Australians. Uh, some of the best stockmen that ever drove cattle were Indigenous uh, men who took to the job uh, with so much ease and, under and because they understood the country were able to move cattle large, long distances with water and uh, the degree of comfort to make sure that they weren't stressing. But all of that history is part of the tapestry of what we should be talking about and not just focusing on, say, national approaches of an event that is not localised but is seen as, for example, the historical element of um, Cook's uh, voyage around Australia, scientific, outstanding element of scientific discoveries that made a difference in understanding uh, this region. Because it wasn't just Australia, it was New Zealand, it was then where he travelled over other locations. But we also look at it from the shore and say these are the things that were observed by Aboriginal people in the interactions with uh, Captain Cook as he moved around the nation. Now, when we're there's plenty of history. Now, when we're talking about this history and education, nothing is more important than the truth. It doesn't matter what our ideology is. It doesn't matter what our emotional position is or our preferences are. Nothing's more important than the truth. Now, you mentioned Bruce Pascoe's book, Dark Emu. Uh, there's a lot of very, very substantial and well-documented uh, uh, evidence against that book, suggesting that a lot of what is printed in that book is untrue. Do you think it's acceptable that we now have a forensic debate about the claims in that book that they're tested against the evidence, the historical evidence? Well, I think when we go through library collections, we look at public records, we look at diaries that are in, held in collections, what, perma what comes out of that and percolates to the surface are the entries that are made that would probably substantiate uh, those points that he makes within his book. Uh, it's easy to tear apart uh, history if you have a view that is contrary to the way in which the stories have been told and retold and they become part of the understanding of the history within an area or a region. But Minister... So when but, you start but, to but, look but, at but Minister, collections, then that makes a difference. But, Minister, the issue with Bruce Pascoe's book is that even the sources he cites aren't what they uh, purported to be in his book. Uh, Peter O'Brien says that almost every significant claim that Pascoe makes that is sourced turns out to be either false or misrepresented. He says, even worse, it promotes a divisive victim-based agenda that pits one Australian against another. He says, as a purported history, Dark, Hugh, Dark Emu is worthless. Yet this book has been given prizes and is now going on to school syllabuses and is being taught as fact. Well, part of that process, it, if I'd had concerns, if I'd read that book and I was analysing it, I would have sought to have a discussion with the author. Uh, I would have sought to uh, look at the sources and had the discussion around where were those sources, uh, are they the right ones, are there other alternative sources that were also used and not cited, because any of us that do academic research will certainly cite uh, where our findings come from, but we are also informed by uh, oral history, we're informed by other readings, because of the nature of when you uh, re write the way in which you see that history then you do the substantiation. But look, I would first of all have a discussion with uh, the author and uh, have that challenge and allow a healthy discussion to occur. Because I, I know Bruce and I know the work that he does and he has an incredible knowledge of our history uh, and he would have referenced uh, sources that he thought were credible.
Yeah, well, he has referenced them, but others uh, go back to those same sources and say that he has, uh, he has um, manipulated them, to say the least. Uh, you know, Bruce Pascoe, there is now discussion about uh, whether he has the right to claim he's Indigenous. Uh, this is always an ugly discussion, but uh, do you think uh, if he's claiming that he is uh, uh, Indigenous, does have Indigenous heritage, uh, he should also tell us about that? Look, within our communities, we know who we are. And it's always interesting in terms of um, acknowledging where you're from. When individuals like Bruce or even some of us at times are questioned about our Indigenous heritage, and then when you show people photographs of your families, they then pull back. But Chris, we never, we never say to a Jewish person, demonstrate your Jewishness. We never say to an Italian, demonstrate your Italianness. We tend to do that frequently in this country, and we do it with Indigenous Australians. I've never heard anybody question the ethnicity of another Australian who says they're Greek or they're per Peruvian or whatever. Uh, I just see it applied in this instance. And I, if Bruce tells me he's Indigenous, then I know that he's Indigenous because he would not be making that claim knowing that he would know both of his family lines.